Hello, welcome, welcome back, back to the Anatomy, Anatomy Show, Show with, with your hosts, Miss Tebow and Miss Abby Samra. Miss O'Connor's in Texas, but she'll hopefully join us uh, for our next show. Today's show is about the skeletal, the skeletal system. system. Okay, so your do now is this. How many bones do you think you have in your body? So pause the video for a second and go through your body and see if you can count up how many bones you think you have in your body and try to estimate. Just jot down a number. What did you come up with? So we'll see how close you come to the real number a little later on. So here we go. Here's our essential question. All right, so we're going to be looking at what is the function of the skeleton? What are the roles of joints in the body? What are the characteristics of bone? What are some of the major bones in the body? How do you keep your bones healthy and strong? What are some of the major injuries that the skeletal system can have and how can they be identified? And then how can joint and bone injuries be treated? And your key terms, there's kind of a lot. Skeleton, compact bone, spongy bone, cartilage, ligament, joint, marrow, osteoporosis, fracture, dislocation, sprain, x-ray, arthritis, arthroscope, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, you might have heard that term before. And then um, we're going to ask you to memorize some of the major bones in your body. So your cranium or skull, your vertebrae, which are also your backbone, your clavicle or collarbone, your ribs, pelvis and hips, scapula, humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, femur, tibia, fibula, and tarsals. And then the one that's not on here is also phalanges. So you can add that to your list. That's P H A L A N G E S. Is that right? Phalanges. So. <laughs> phalanges. Okay. So just to start us off, what do you think we would look like without bones? Take a second to think about that. How do you think we would move around? Bones actually do a lot for us. What do you think would happen if we got hit in the head? Say someone threw a baseball at you and you didn't have a skull. Ouch. Right? So bones do a lot, right? They actually help support us so that we're not just a blob of muscles on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> they help us move around, right? Our muscles wouldn't do much if they didn't have a bone to pull on. Absolutely. And they definitely help protect us, right? If you got hit in the head with that ball, your brain would have some serious damage if you didn't have your skull to protect it. So think about some of the other things your bones might do for you. And there's some things that are hidden that might not come to your mind right away, but we'll talk about those too. Okay, so here's the main jobs of your skeletal system. So as you might have guessed, your skeletal system helps provide shape and structure and support your body. So your muscles have um, something to hang on to. Uh, your muscles store minerals and other materials, especially things like um, phosphorus and calcium inside the actual bone itself. Your skeleton helps you to move, helps mobility by your muscles attaching and pulling on those bones. Your skeletal system protects your internal organs. So Ms. Abusama was talking about your brain. If you get hit with something um, on your skull, your skull protects your very important brain underneath, but also your ribs protect all your inner organs. And the other job that your skeleton does is make you blood cells. So they're little blood cell factories. All right, so we've got kind of two parts of the skeleton. We're going to start off with what we call the axial skeleton. So think about an axis in math, right? It's kind of the main lines that run down the center of a graph. So the axial skeleton is very similar to that. It's the bones that run down the center of your body. So your skull or your cranium, right? Your backbone runs right down the center of your body, also called your spine or your vertebrae. Your backbone consists of 26 bones, and the way that they all come together allows you to bend and twist in all the ways that you can. Right? And then we separate them into these different regions. So the top, kind of where your neck is, is your cervical vertebrae. The back, kind of behind where your ribs are, is your thoracic vertebrae. Where your lower back is, is your lumbar vertebrae. And then you have your sacrum and your coccyx, which together kind of make up your tailbone. So that would be the part that you're sitting on. Right? 
And then you have your rib cage, which is also part of the axial skeleton. Again, that's going to really help to protect those vital organs, things like your heart and your lungs. And then your sternum, which is your chest, um, your breastbone, which kind of helps hold everything all together and, again, helps protect those really vital organs there. Um, part of your axial skeleton is your skull. And believe it or not, your skull is made up of a number of different bones, and these are sort of flat bones um, that end up, they fuse together. So when a baby is born, if you look at the top picture, it shows um, the skeleton of the skull of a baby. And you can see that there's some gaps. And if anybody has a baby in their family, you know that babies have what's called a soft spot on top of their head. And you have to be careful when you're, when you're you know, touching a baby's skull that you don't hurt them on the soft spot. Um, it's called the fontanelle. And it's, it's where the plates are starting to fuse together, but they haven't completely fused together. If you look at the diagram on the bottom where it shows an adult, all those skull plates are fused together and they stay like that forever. Um, in class, we're going to pass around a model of a skull, and you can see it for yourself how they're kind of like a zigzag um, fuse, fused all together. And something that's super interesting is that since those bones haven't fused together, babies actually have more bones than we do. Isn't that neat? All right, so we talked about the axial skeleton, which runs down the axis of your body, and everything else is going to be called the appendicular skeleton. So an appendix in a book is like the extra bit in a book. The appendicular skeleton it is not really extra, but it kind of sticks out from the um, axial skeleton. So this would be your shoulders and your arms and your hands and your clavicle, your collarbone that kind of supports the shoulders, and then your legs and your feet and your hips that support your, your um, lower limbs. So axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. And here's all the bones all together on, um, with this slide that has the green and purple skeleton. Shows the axial skeleton. You have 80 bones in your axial skeleton. And you have 126 bones in your appendicular skeleton. So what's your grand total? Do the math. What'd you come up with? 206. And here's the weird thing. What room are we in in our class? Room 206. Mind blown. <laughs> One of my classes, at my first year teaching, noticed that and everybody thought it was the coolest thing. So. Um, okay, so go through your body while we're sitting here and put your hands on your bones as you go through. So start with your cranium. So as we're talking about this, put your hand on your cranium and then put your hand on your mandible, which is your jawbone. It doesn't show it in this picture, but your jawbone. Your lower jaw is your mandible. Um, then put your hand on your vertebrae. Feel your ribs. Feel your sternum. And then go through and feel all the bones in your appendicular skeleton. So your clavicle is your collarbone. You can kind of feel it um, just at the top of your shoulders between your neck and your arm. Your scapula is on your back. It's the shoulder blade on your back. The humerus is the bone that is your upper part of your arm, and it's humerus, not humerus like a joke. It's spelled differently. Um, your radius and your ulna are the two bones in your lower arm, and a way you can tell the difference between these two, um, your ulna is the one that's closest to your pinky, and if you feel your elbow, it's you can feel that bone going all the way down and attaching just on the side of your pinky. And then the other one is called the radius, and that's the one that's closest to the thumb. And that's the one that allows you to turn your arm. So if you think of like a radius in a circle, this is the bone that allows you to turn your wrist and get that nice movement in your wrist. Your carpals are your wrist bones. Um, and then your metacarpals, it doesn't show it on the list, but it's on the diagram. Your metacarpals are your hand bones. And then your phalanges are your fingers. Now let's move down to the um, lower, lower legs. So the, your hips, you start with your hips, also known as the pelvis or the pelvic girdle. Then you have your femur, which is your thigh bone. Your tibia and your fibula are those two bones of your lower leg. Um, these are sometimes hard to keep straight as far as which one is which. 
Um, but if you look at them in the picture, the tibia is a thick bone and the fibula is a skinny little bone on the outside. So that the bigger word is the smaller bone and the smaller word is the bigger bone. That's one of the ways that we can remember it. Um, the tibia is your shin bone. So if you feel the front of your leg, you can feel your tibia. Um, another way that you can remember it is the word it and of. It for inside tibia and of for outside fibula. So a couple little tricks to help you remember those. So then moving down, you have your tarsals, which are your ankle bones, including your heel, your metatarsals, which are your foot bones, and then again, your toes are phalanges. That's kind of a fun, fun word to say. So we're going to be playing Simon Says in the next couple of days, so try to study these and memorize these. When you're in the car, just kind of go through your body, go, okay, this is this bone and this is that bone, and try to really memorize those because we're going to be playing Simon Says in class. Um, and this diagram shows um, two special bones in your neck, the atlas and the axis, that allow you to bend your head and turn your head. All right. So as Ms. Thibault said earlier, one of the important functions of the bone is to store substances. So um, you probably know that, you know, drinking milk, having calcium builds strong bones, right? But your bones actually store a lot. So calcium and phosphorus are going to be... Um, two of the major things that your bone is storing and when your body needs more of that it can grab some from the stores that are in your bones. Mm -hmm. um, the bone marrow which is the inside part of the bone we'll talk about in a minute um, actually produces your red blood cells which is super cool. So if you look at this picture the bone marrow in that um, picture to the right of the bone that's sort of broken open the bone marrow is that pink stuff that's inside the bone. So your joints of your skeleton, this is what allows you to move your skeleton. Um, so the joints are where two bones come together or connect and this allows us to move our bones and our bodies in different ways. And there are two kinds of joints. We've got immovable joints, we talked about that earlier with our skull, those, those joints that are fused together, they don't move. Once they're in place, that's it. And then we have movable joints, which are much more fun than the immovable joints. Um, so these are things that allow a wide range of movement. Um, our skeleton is held together by ligaments, and ligaments are strong connective tissue. If you remember the um, four tissue types we talked about in the last um, show, uh, <laughs> um, connective tissue was one of those. So cartilage is another kind of connective tissue that is on the ends of the bones. You have cartilage on the end of your nose, you have cartilage in your ears. So it gives you structure, but it's softer and bend it's bendable. And its job within your skeleton is to cushion your bones, which is really important. Yeah. Um, you don't cartilage, want two bones yeah. grinding against each other. Ouch, yeah. that's painful. So let's talk about the four joints. All right, so we've got four types of movable joints. Um, the first one is a hinge joint, so think the hinge of a door, right? It just goes backward and forward, so these are things like your knee or your elbow, where it is really just kind of hinging open and closed like a door. Um, you have a ball and socket joint. This is going to give you the biggest range of motion, because you can go in almost any direction. So think your shoulder, right? You can wave your arm around in whichever direction you want, as long as it's not going back into your body. And your hips. Yep. Um, pivot joints are going to be for rotation, so think if you pivot around something, you're rotating around it, right? So this is like your neck, right? Your skull is kind of pivoting around your vertebrae. And then the last one is what we call a gliding joint. This one's kind of weird. So one bone slides over the other, and the biggest examples of these are going to be in your wrist. Um, it's kind of hard to picture. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a cumulative effect because one bone is gliding against each other, but because you have so many bones in your wrist, it actually allows you to move your wrist in a lot of different ways because there's so many bones that are gliding past each other there. Um, so this diagram just shows some of those joints again. You can see the ball and socket joint in your arms and your hips. Um, and we'll have a chance to look at bony Tony and bony Joni when we're in class, and you can see what it looks like on them your pivot joint, um, and you can imagine an owl must have a really incredible pivot joint, your hinge joints in your wrists and your ankles, um, there's 
joints called ellipsoidal joints, which we, you don't really need to know, but they exist. Oh wait, did I say hinge joint in your wrists and ankles? Hinge joint in your elbow, I'm sorry. Um, and then uh, your knee joint, which is also a hinge joint, and your hip, which is a ball and socket joint. And just another diagram. All right, so now we're getting into the structure of the bones themselves. So they are living. A lot of people think about bones as something non-living inside your body, kind of like a rock. Like a rock, yeah. But it's not. It is living. They're made out of cells. Um, and they undergo growth and development, just like the rest of your body. That's so cool. Yeah. So they are still super strong, but they're also fairly lightweight. You don't want them to be too, too heavy. Yeah, um, if they were solid, completely solid, that would be a lot of weight to carry around. Yeah. Your skull is already super, super heavy. Imagine if it was completely solid. You'd never be able to pick your head up. <laughs> um, so they're made mostly out of phosphorus and calcium, but like I said, there are cells in there, so they are still alive. Yeah. Um, so you have different types of bone tissue. Um, you have, and the, the bone structure is made out of a couple different parts. So the outer membrane is a thin, tough membrane that covers most of the bone except at the ends. And um, the outer membrane is the point of entry for blood vessels and nerves. Just inside that outer membrane is what's called the compact bone. And this is hard and dense, but it's not completely solid. If you were to look at um, compact bone under the microscope, you would see little tunnels, little canals running through it. And there would be nerves running through those canals. There would be blood vessels running through those canals. So there's a lot going on on a really small scale. Um, just inside the compact bone, you have what we call spongy bone. So it's called spongy bone because... But it's not soft, though. It looks It's spongy yeah. because it's like full of holes. Yeah, so it looks kind of like a sponge, but it would still feel hard to you if you were to touch it. Um, but it has all those little spaces inside that contain marrow. Um, so bone marrow, we've got two types in our body. Yellow bone marrow basically stores fat. It's just another energy reserve in your body. And then red marrow is what's producing your blood cells. So when you're a kid, you have a lot more red marrow so that as you grow, you can make more and more blood to fill up your body. And as you get older, that red marrow, most of it gets converted into yellow marrow. That's neat. So like we said, red marrow produces our blood cells and yellow marrow stores um, fat, which is energy reserves for us. And we know that bones are strong, but light. Um, in humans, um, we talked about the structure. In a bird, they're hollow, which is kind of neat. That enables them to be even lighter and fly. Um, and our bones contain minerals, phosphorus, and calcium, which give them strength. Just another diagram of the bone, different parts of the bone. Here's a photo micrograph of a bone, and you can see the compact bone. You can't really see the membrane. Um, but you can see the compact bone, and you can see the spongy bone that's full of holes. And this diagram again shows a femur, which is the, the thigh bone, and the structure of the bone, the outer membrane, the compact bone, the bone marrow, and the spongy bone. And if we look at it really closely, there are those blood vessels and those canals that we talked about um, in the compact bone. All right, now this is really kind of cool. When you're a baby, before you're born, all your bones start out as cartilage, and it's sort of like a cartilage model or template of what your bone is, is going to grow up into. So it starts out as cartilage, and then something called ossification happens, where that cartilage is replaced by bone material. So you can see the progression from um, a cartilage model to a full bone. If we look at a um, x-ray of a baby, you can see, look in the hands, look in the hands, there's not that much bone there, a lot of it is cartilage. In the hips there's a lot of cartilage, the knees are a lot of, a lot of cartilage, so this baby, and you can see the fontanelle up at the top of the head, where the um, plates of the skull have not fused together yet, you can see that too. That's kind of neat. So, Taking care of our bones, super important. Yeah, so diet is going to be super, super important when you're taking care of your bones. They always say, you know, drink your milk. Mm -hmm. Milk is not the best source of calcium, but you definitely want to get foods and drinks that do have a lot of calcium and a lot of phosphorus um, in order to keep building up those strong bones, especially at your age when you guys are still growing. 
um, exercise, if you do weight-bearing exercises, that will strengthen your bones along with your muscles, um, which is super, super important. Mm -hmm. And when you look at, you know, we were talking about drinking milk and dairy products have um, calcium in them, but there are vegetables that have a lot more. So take a look at this list. It's kind of crazy. Bok choy. Look how much um, calcium is in 100 calories of bok choy. So over a thousand. So bok choy, if you don't know what it is, it's pictured um, there with the white stalks and the green leaves. It's found in a lot of stir fries. It's kind of yummy. Um, so where's milk on that list? 194. That's not that much. So there, like all the dark leafy greens have a lot of calcium. All right, osteoporosis. So as we age, we do lose those minerals that we're storing in bones. So as you get older, you're going to use the calcium and the phosphorus that your bones are storing. And that's not super good for your bones. So if you look at this little diagram here, we've got what a normal bone looks like. And you can see there are holes in it, right? But it still looks pretty sturdy. And as you use the minerals from it, it ends up looking more and more like a sponge and less stuff there to hold more you porous, up. More yeah. So the word osteoporosis, oste means bone, and porosis means holes. So these are holes in your bones, basically. And if you imagine this, a bone that ha is, is structured like this, it's going to become weaker, it's going to become more brittle, and it's going to be easier to break. So this happens with older people sometimes. Um, and you can see in the diagram, if it happens in your spine, this is why some older people actually get a little bit shorter because their, their bones are, um, their weight is kind of pushing down on those bones. And this can have some really bad effects. So you can see in this diagram as, you know, this person slouches more and more, their stomach ends up kind of pushing out. When my grandfather got osteoporosis, mm -hmm. instead of pushing out, his stomach actually went up into his chest. Whoa. And that was not good. You couldn't eat more than like the amount yeah. of like a golf ball oh before gosh, getting full. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's really important to, you know, get good healthy habits. We talk about this a lot with all the body systems, but really start good habits, exercising and eating well. Okay, so things happen with your bones. Probably a lot of you have broken bones in the past, um, have gotten different kinds of injuries. So some common injuries are a fracture, which is a, a break in a bone, and there can be all different kinds of fractures. So if you look at the diagram at the bottom, there's a simple fracture, and you can see where that, um, that bone is broken. Do you remember the name of that bone? Tibia. Nice yeah. job. <laughs> and then there's um, some fractures that are a little more serious, one where it actually pokes out of the skin. It's so bad. Um, a dislocation is when a bone comes out of joint, and that can be super painful. So if you look at that picture, the thumb has actually come out of joint. And a sprain is when the ligaments stretch too far and they tear. So how do we figure out what's going on with your bones? So one of the ways is by using an x-ray. So if you've ever had a broken bone or anything like that, you've had an x-ray done where they can look at the bones in your body. So it's good for looking at the bones, but it's not good for looking at any other types of organs. Yeah. So you're not going to look at your stomach with an x-ray. Or soft things like cartilage. Yeah. yeah. Um, so basically... They expose you to radiation, electromagnetic radiation, and the x-rays pass through your skin and they hit the film the same way that light goes through your camera and hits the film in your camera. But those waves get absorbed by the bone, so they don't hit the film and they don't leave an impact there. So your bones are going to look uh, more white usually on the x-ray. Um, it's relatively low cost, so you might not get a perfect picture, but especially if you just have a fracture or something like that, it's a really easy way to just see what's going on with your bones. Um, this picture is kind of cool. This is from 1895, and this was the first x-ray that was taken um, by a man named Wilhelm Rotgen. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. I probably am not, but... Um, and this was his wife's hand, and you can see the ring on her finger. So those long bones below the finger are not actually her finger bones. Those are her hand bones. Those are her metacarpals. And then her phalanges are where the ring is and above. And the story is that she was kind of a little freaked out by this because she thought it was like a picture of her death. <laughs> 
Um, another way that we can look at what's happening in our bodies is with an MRI, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Um, so this uses magnets, um, short bursts of this magnetic energy, and basically vibrates the atoms in your body. That's so neat. They're super, super cool. Um, so a computer can analyze how they're vibrating and basically give you an image of what's happening in your body. So this can show the soft tissue, the bone, basically everything. So not like an x-ray, which will only show you that hard bone tissue. Right, and if you look at that picture in the middle, you can see the bones, where they come together, and what you're looking at is the knee. You can see the kneecap, or the patella, we didn't talk about the name of that bone before, but that's the patella that's sort of um, on the left-hand side. You can see the muscles, um, you can see some fat, you can see the skin, and if you're really trained at that, the anatomy of these joints, you can see a lot of detail in those. One of the things that we can also do is an arthroscopy. Um, so basically, anytime you see the word scopy, it means that they're going to put a camera in your body. So an endoscopy is putting a camera down your throat. Colonoscopy is going to be putting a camera up in, into your colon. Um, so arthro is going to usually mean joints. Um, so an arthroscopy is going to look at your joints. So they basically... Um, put a little tiny camera into your joints to see what's going on. To see where the problem is. Yeah. And a way that they can treat joint injuries is to really replace the whole joint. So, you know, you may know somebody who's had a hip replacement. Um, and if the hip is, you know, to the point where it doesn't really work anymore, then these hip replacements can give people the mo motion and freedom that um, is so important. Um, and that is it. The end. Um, there's some websites on this last page that are uh, you can take a look at um, if you have a little time. But other than that, um, just try to memorize your bones as you're driving from here to there and be ready for Simon Says. Okay, have a great day, everybody. Bye. Bye.